Plus, when you trade in your old printer in-store, you'll save an additional $50. Staples, there's a whole lot in-store. And 2219, see associate for details. The Super Bowl may be six days away, but people are still talking about that controversial call in the NFC Championship game. It's being hailed as the worst call ever made by an NFL referee, a blatant case of pass interference that Saints fans say cost New Orleans the NFC Championship. But that should have been a penalty. And sent the L.A. Rams here to Super Bowl 53. Atlanta Falcons owner and Super Bowl host Arthur Blank says he too found that call disturbing. We can count on a pretty pretty strong evaluation of that. What will lead to, I'm not sure. The issue is sure to come up Wednesday when League Commissioner Roger Goodell meets the media here ahead of the big game. Pete Combs, ABC News, Atlanta. Facebook creates a new external content oversight board. In a statement, Facebook says it's chartering an independent board that would allow users to appeal decisions by Facebook on whether to allow or remove their posts. The board will not include current or former Facebook officials and would have the power to reverse decisions on user content made by Facebook. The company says says over the next six months, it's conducting research and holding workshops around the world to finalize some key issues regarding the oversight board, such as the number of members, length of terms, and how cases will be selected. Mark Remillard, ABC News. Two Minnesota lawmakers have proposed legislation to legalize recreational marijuana in that state starting in the year 2022. The two Democratic lawmakers say at least they want hearings on the issue. This is ABC News. Uber has been doing a ton of great things this last year, and Uber Rewards is going to make you love Uber even more. With Uber Rewards, you'll get rewarded for things you're already doing. Every eligible dollar you spend on rides and Uber Eats earns you points that unlock amazing benefits, like Uber Cash, complimentary surprise upgrades, flexible cancellations, and so much more. Your life is about to get more rewarding thanks to Uber. Get all the info and terms at uber.com rewards. That's uber.com rewards. Daria Albinger, ABC News. From the KMAT Weather Center for Beaumont in the Pass area, heading into the evening, get any party cloudy tonight with a low of 52, weather winds to 20 miles an hour. Have a mostly sunny Tuesday, our high 69. Tuesday night, get any mostly cloudy, a low of 51. Have a mostly sunny Wednesday with a high of 64. For the Inland Empire tonight, with a partly cloudy skies at a low of 53. For Palm Springs, our low should be 56 with partly cloudy conditions. I'm Rod Tanner for Smart Talk 1490 KMET. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk, KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM.com. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane and have Sean in studio. Now, this is a show about what matters most in life, our mind, thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I'll bring you the latest study regarding how exposure to stress and cannabis together in adolescence can lead to anxiety disorders in adulthood. And after that, I'll talk to Dr. Christine Padesky, the co-founder of the Center for Cognitive Therapy in Huntington Beach, California. We're going to talk about anxiety in her book, mind over mood and you can call us both on um, the studio line if you like to ask questions or share with us conversations that you have about anxiety in 951-922-3532 we'll be right back with the tip of the week (music) 
Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk, KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490AM.com. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the awareness integration model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. I have been so aware of the importance of having a clear mind this week, mostly this week. It's been so apparent to me with the clients I've had, with people that I talk to. It just seems so much more prevalent to say whether the reasons are lack of sleep, poor eating habits, being tired, overworked, um, or you know, using drugs, alcohol, or any mind altering substances such as pills. The inability to think clearly and regulate emotions are detrimental, not only to the person, but also to their family, to their mate, to their children, to people who come in contact with them. So when a person does not take care of themselves and act responsibly toward keeping healthy, everyone suffers, them, including them and everyone else. Now, the suffering then gives to more non-functionality and needing to avoid, run away, um, use more mind-altering substances or some sort of a pill or other destructive acts, which becomes then a vicious cycle. And everybody has justified, well, I'm suffering or I'm tired, I'm this, I'm that. And then this thing just loops and loops and loops. So take care of your mind and body. Now, you only got one to operate from. When you suffer, you also impact everyone around you and create suffering for them as well. So what happens is then you create suffering for them and then they have justified to create suffering for you. So it kind of keeps going and going and going. Now, by taking care of yourself, you can end your suffering and hopefully the ones around you, at least the one you're impacting uh, by your actions and uh, decisions. You deserve to be healthy and joyous. You're powerful enough to create joy or misery for yourself and everyone around you. So choose. I mean, I suggest you choose joy, right? So we'll be right back with research. Exposure to cannabis and stress in adolescents can lead to anxiety disorders in adulthood. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time-limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the awareness integration model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com. 
Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM.com. Welcome back to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zaid, and I'm letting you know about a new study conducted on laboratory animals showing that exposure to cannabis and stress during adolescence may lead to long-term anxiety disorders characterized by the presence of pathological fear. Now, the work carried out by the Neuropharmacology Laboratory at Neurofar at Pompeu Fabra University in Barcelona, published in the Journal of Neuropharmacology. Now, cannabis remains the most commonly consumed legal some places, an illegal drug worldwide. Now, its usage is often uh, begins during adolescence, which is especially troubling because this period is crucial for the brain to mature properly through the organization of the neuronal synapses. Now, numerous preclinical and epidemiological data suggest that exposure to cannabinoids in adolescence may increase the risk of the onset of psychiatric illnesses in adulthood. The results of the National Drug Plan show an increase in the consumption of cannabis, and a recent review highlights that in recent years, the perception of the risk of its consumption has diminished among the young population from 12 to 17 years of age. In this study, they have investigated the effects of sim uh, simultaneous exposure to, to THC, which is the primarily responsible for the psychoactive properties of cannabis, and to stress during adolescence. Specifically, they have studied how their exposure during adolescence affects the extinction of the memory of fear in mice. Occasionally, a stimulus that should be neutral as could be, for example, seeing the dentist in a white coat is associated with a threatening one, which would be the pain we have felt upon previous visits to the dentist and causes a fear response. Normally, fear reactions diminish over time as the conditioned stimulus ceases to be associated with the negative experience. This is known as fear extinction. But when fear extinction does not occur properly, anxiety disorders such as post-traumatic stress disorders, phobias, and panic attacks occur. They observe that adolescent mice treated with THC and exposed to stress display impaired fear extinction in adulthood. However, this effect was not observed in animals exposed to the same two factors separately. In addition, the resistance to fear extinction was associated with the decrease in neuronal activity in the basolateral amygdala and the infralimpic prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, suggesting a deregulating in the long term of the circuit that regulates fear. So their finding highlights the influence of environmental factors such as stress on the harmful effects of the exposure to cannabis during early ages and suggests that the consequence of early cannabis use greatly depend on the environment of its use. The study concludes that the presence of stress situations common among consumers of the substance may worsen the harmful effect of cannabis. So two things that are um, important for you to, to see. One, it is a time that the brain is getting um, mature. So any type of a substance that is regularly used um, obviously is going to alter the mind, uh, alter the brain. And uh, when there's stress factors among that, which at this time, adolescents appear to have a lot of stress, 
going from schools and the concept of social media, everything that is going to give them stress at this time, even naturally, like in the best of families, in the best of scenario, adolescents go through a lot of stress. And you can imagine in families that stress is there or they're, um, they're not very functional, the two together would really create um, some sort of a, a predisposition to creating adulthood anxiety disorders. So um, we're going to actually talk more about anxiety. Uh, our guest is Dr. Christine Padesky. She's a co-founder of the Center for Cognitive Therapy in Huntington Beach, California. She's a graduate of Yale University and UCLA and has received state, national, and international awards, including the Aaron T. Beck Award from the Academy of Cognitive Therapy for her enduring contributions to the field. Her work has been featured in magazines, newspapers, televisions, radio, and podcasts in many countries around the world. She's actually been on my show a couple of times, and I've always had great reviews from all of the listeners and the viewers uh, about her conversation and the way she uh, explains about anxiety and uh, depression. Growing up in the Midwestern United States, she was raised with dual values of self-help and the importance of contributing to the community. These values led Dr. Padisky to becoming a cognitive behavioral therapist because CBT is dedicated to helping people learn skills that they can practice independently to be their own therapist and live happier, more fulfilled lives. Her quest to help more people learn these valuable skills led her to co-write, along with Dennis Greenberger, the best-selling self-help book, Mind Over Mood, Change How You Feel by Changing the Way You Think. This book has won numerous national and international awards and sold more than the 1.1 million copies in 23 languages. That is amazing. I'm so excited to have her back with us. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with Dr. Christine Padetsky. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, the awareness path to create the life you want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk, KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM dot com. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the awareness integration model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. Or go to www.fujan.com.
Welcome back, everybody, to Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I'm so excited to speak with Dr. Christine Paditsky. She's uh, the co-founder of the Center for Cognitive Therapy in Huntington Beach, California. It is so exciting to have you back with us again. It's my pleasure to be talking with you again today, Fujian. Um, it is uh, exciting for me because every time that I've spoken with you these these past years, um, I get a lot of people who send back and say that they learn so much from our conversation, from the way that you explain, um, especially with your latest book or uh, the Mind Over Mood, uh, which is uh, talks about the depression and anxiety. And I know in a couple of our other conversations, we've spoken about depression and uh, the mood that causes and and the way that the mood is uh, is created and what we can do. And I'm um, asking, I guess, everybody to also go back to the YouTube channel and listen to all of those. But today, we're going to talk about anxiety. Yes. So what causes anxiety, which everybody has somehow? <laughs> yes, we all have anxiety. Anxiety is actually a very normal human emotion. Uh, but we can get into trouble when anxiety becomes so great that it starts really driving our lives. Yes. And uh, there's actually a simple way to understand what causes anxiety. Um, and I like to think about it as if you put danger and coping and resources on a, like a seesaw, where they go up and down, uh, people get anxious when they think there's a lot of danger facing them. And so as danger gets bigger, people naturally get anxious. But the interesting thing is we could have a lot of challenges and dangers in our lives and not feel anxious if we feel like our coping and resources are good enough that they'll help us handle the danger. So what that means is that anxiety is really getting out of whack between danger and coping and resources. And that provides some good news for us because it means we can actually, once we start feeling anxious, reduce it either by lowering our perception that things are dangerous or by increasing our coping and resources. And the Mind Over Mood book helps people do both of those things. I think something that you just said is just the perception. Many times uh, there really isn't danger, but there is a perception of danger on many, many layers. And then so obviously we go back into that emotion that comes up. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, this perceptual concept and the reality check or uh, getting to see how do we, is it really dangerous? Do I have to have that much fear? Yeah. Well, a lot of times things are not as dangerous as we think they are. For example, uh, one of the things that we sometimes do in in therapy with people who worry about blushing. If you ask someone who worries about blushing, how red is your face? And you show them a color wheel like paint strips from a store, they will usually pick like a bright red, kind of like your lipstick. And then if we, when they're giving a talk or doing something and they feel themselves blushing and we take a picture of them with their cell phone and then have them look at it and compare, they see, oh, well, my face really wasn't that red. And maybe other people, it wouldn't even look as red as it felt like to me. So there are lots of ways we try to get people to check out, is the danger as bad as you think it is? Because you make a very good point. Most of the time when we're highly anxious, the danger is not quite as bad as we're predicting it's going to be. And it's wonderful to hear that uh, part of the way to tell people in um, for themselves is to create those types of reality check because it's just their anxiety does not allow them. And I yes. get it that a lot of times people, uh, something becomes um, dangerous for them or they don't like it. And the first thing they do is run away from it or at least attempt to run away as soon as possible, either physically, psychologically, through uh, distracting or through uh, you know mind altering substances, through many things. So um, can you talk a little bit about this type of an avoidance that almost everybody instantaneously tries to do? Yes. Uh, actually, avoidance is the number one response to anxiety. None of us likes feeling anxious. When we feel anxious, we want to just get out of there. 
the the problem with that, and as you said, there's lots of ways we get out of there. We can literally leave the situation, which many people do if they can. We can avoid going into the situation. So if I have a fear of flying, I just won't go on airplanes. Uh, we can mentally kind of dissociate or take ourselves out of the situation or use drugs or alcohol to kind of numb ourselves in the situation. The, the problem with all those types of avoidance is that we never, when we're avoiding, we don't get to find out, is the danger so bad? And even more importantly, we don't get to practice coping with what frightens us. And it's actually in the learning to cope with what frightens us. And many people have heard the phrase, face your fears. It's really true that it's hard to get over anxiety without facing your fears and practicing and learning to cope with the things that scare you. And anxiety will never go away if you're consistently avoiding, because like you said, we're not ever going to learn. Our muscles are never going to get uh, uh, wor work through this to learn how to handle it. And I'm assuming that whatever it is that we're anxious about, it's really not going to go away. So as, as long as, you know, we're not dealing with it. So if we're anxious about finances and we're not necessarily doing something about it, then it's not going to go away. It's just going to probably get worse with worse consequences. Um, if we're, you know, anxious about things that are happening outside and we're not dealing with it, they're just not going to go away by itself. And I think that's what we're pretending with the avoidance. Like if I, if I don't look at it long enough, it'll just go away and won't bother me anymore. Yes. And there is that kind of hope that if we hide our head in, under the blanket, that the the monster will disappear. And it's much better to actually get your head out from under the blanket, look under the bed and find out, is the monster really there? And if there are certain struggles in our life, like maybe we're afraid of uh, speaking in public, we get socially anxious, or we have a lot of worries about things, if we can spend time and we don't have to face our fears all at once, we can face them for five or 10 minutes today and maybe another 10 minutes tomorrow and we can gradually make progress toward uh, approaching the things that frighten us and also figure out what can we do to cope with these things? How can we manage it? So that's where I think it is a struggle for people because people who've been avoiding for a long time, they don't really know what to do necessarily to manage worries or anxiety in a certain situation. So what is the first step someone can take to understand their own anxiety and then work with it, let's say? Well, the very first step is to figure out what your anxiety is about. Now, that might seem kind of silly. Why do you have to figure it out? But actually, oftentimes we avoid so well that we don't even think about what is it I'm afraid of. So uh, we ask people, you know, what's the worst that could happen? That's the best question you can ask yourself. What's the worst that could happen if I go into this situation? Uh, maybe we have a supervisor and we've been wanting to go in and talk about changing our work hours. And we're really nervous about doing this. And so we avoid it, but we can say, well, what's the worst that would happen? And, and it often helps, this is often in imagery in our mind, so it can help to imagine the situation and say, what's the worst I can imagine? Maybe the worst I can imagine is my supervisor is going to get angry with me and start shouting at me and say, I can't change my work hours. Well, first of all, you can ask, is the danger real? Does this fit with my supervisor? Is this how they usually react to people? Is it likely to be this bad? But the second thing we can do is say, well, even if the supervisor does that, what would be a good way of responding to that? Should I just say, okay, and leave the room, which might be appropriate with some supervisors? Or should I say, well, I need to explain some of my reasons. I have some family um, illness right now that I need to attend to, or I have some issues going on in my life, let me explain it. So we can use our imagination as a first step in dealing with anxiety, first to figure out what's our biggest danger that worries us, and the secondly is to, in our imagination, practice what would be some ways I could cope and handle this. So part of what I've noticed with people who have anxiety, the what if question shows up and they get stuck in that what if. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't go beyond that what if. They get stuck right into that, you know, narrow space 
uh, of the fear itself, but not facing the fear. And what I'm hearing you suggest is, can we go inside? It's your imagination. Yes. You're not actually in it. You're just imagining it. Yes. So it's okay. Like just because you're imagining it, it is not going to happen. But let's go for it in an imagination to look at the worst possible scenario that could happen. Because when you do that, you can then go into the space of actually maybe look at possibilities of coming out of the other side and surviving it and staying alive. <laughs> yes, that's right. And all, and, and all in one piece. <laughs> yes. And we always say, whenever you catch yourself saying, what if, you know, figure out what that's about, what's the worst, and then say to yourself, then what? Then what can I do? Then who can I get to help me? Then how could I handle this? So the then what is just as important as the what if. What if keeps us stuck in anxiety? Then what begins to reveal a path away from anxiety? Now, Dr. Podesky, there's a couple of ways of uh, also looking at different anxieties. So some anxieties appear to be um, like a phase of life concept. You know, like you go from... Uh, high school or high, you know, junior high, you're going to the next level of high school or you're going to college or you finish college. And for the first time you're looking for a job and you're going to a job. Your first time you're going to a date or see your, you know, mother-in-law. I mean, any of those is like probably any of the first times of going from one phase of life to, the, to another has these normal anxieties, which when I call normal, it means like almost everybody goes through it. And then they're all there are also anxieties that are uh, that are might not they're irrational. For example, uh, we might have some anxiety about things that would never happen, and we keep building these scenarios. You know, what if uh, uh, a person that I know is completely going to commit suicide, and you have no signs of that? It's just your own stuff that you know comes up. Versus uh, some of the worries where for, you've had a a bad experience, like maybe you were flying and there were turbulences or something has happened where you really went into some kind of a trauma. And obviously after that, you keep uh, having association with the previous ex negative experience and shows up. So obviously there are different reasons why anxiety shows up. How do you suggest when we're coming to identify and then look at the worst kind of fear and then looking at the alternatives on how to come out, um, how do you suggest a person identifying these and going through the process where the anxiety might be like an existential one or a phase of life issue or an irrational one um, or a, from a pre previous issue? Yes. Well, when, you're absolutely right. There's these different types of anxiety, and we do suggest slightly different approaches for each. So with the phase of life where almost everybody's anxious, applying for a job, uh, transitioning to out of living at home, uh, getting into a close relationship, getting married, all of these things, people normally feel anxiety. With those kinds of things, remember, we want to balance danger with coping and resources. For those natural events that everybody feels anxious about, we can really benefit from using our resources, talk to friends and family members and other people who may have gone through these things and find out from them, how did they handle it? How did they cope? What ideas do they have to make it more successful? Uh, so we can use our resources, uh, the internet. Uh, we can, I myself, when I'm facing new things, I always scan to see, is there a YouTube video that shows me how to do this or gives me some tips? So we can find lots of good suggestions from other people that can help make us feel like, okay, I'm more ready to cope now. And then even though the danger might still the same, we feel more confident going in. When we have a fear that most people don't have, where we even ourselves, usually when we're anxious, we know our fears may be a little bit uh, exaggerated, but that doesn't make them any less real or any yes. less frightening to us. So if we think we might have a more exaggerated fear, then it can really help to maybe make a list like, what's the evidence I have that says this is likely to happen? And is, do I have any evidence that this isn't likely to happen? The interesting thing is, is that people who are anxious often don't learn from their experience. And what I mean from that is, what I mean with that is that they, they may be afraid that people will 
criticize them and mock them if they misspeak or make a mistake. And they may have done this a hundred times in their life and not had people criticize and mock them, but they don't learn from that because they think, well, I was just lucky. The next time my fear will happen. So this is why I often uh, emphasize with people the then what part. Okay, it may not be likely to happen, but even if it did happen, then what could you do? And so we want to imagine and figure out what we could do, check with other people, find out what they do in that situation. Uh, I'll give you a very concrete example. Most people aren't afraid of dogs. People really like dogs for the most part, but some people are terribly afraid of dogs. Maybe a dog bit them in the past or uh, whatever. And with uh, when I work with clients who have a fear of dogs, one of the things I do is we don't just sit in my office, but we go out and walk through the neighborhood because it's a guarantee that dogs will bark at you when you walk through the neighborhood. And then we talk about dogs and we get approach them at a pace that is comfortable for the person. And we get them to learn about dog behavior and to learn that dogs are protecting their environment and why do they bark and what kind of bark or situation makes a dog maybe more dangerous than not. So I think getting out into the world and learning about and approaching your fears and figuring out how to cope with that, which might involve talking to other people and learning what are good coping strategies is uh, really important for fears where you know most people don't share your fear. Mm -hmm. So there's a way that we could look at our anxiety, identify it, see what it is telling us, see the worst case scenario that shows up, and then uh, part of dealing with that identification is then looking at what are uh, some of the ways that I can come out of it. There's also... uh, this concept you were talking about, which is sometimes it keeps repeating. So even if we do this, we won't learn and we keep repeating the same thing as it shows up over and over again. So how can we, like when we know what the issue is, how can we reduce the type of anxiety then? And what can we tell ourselves so that hopefully it doesn't keep showing up as an obsession? Is there a way of Uh, handling the anxiety in a particular way where it just kind of like gets handled versus the same thing opening, you know, keep happening. Yes. Uh, Well, the first thing is, is usually with anxiety, we have kind of an if then belief. So let's suppose we're someone who worries all the time and we might have a belief. Well, if I can get things perfect, then bad things won't go wrong. Uh, That's a very common belief with people who worry a lot as they try to prevent mistakes, make things perfect. Now, that shows that we have this, what we call an assumption. An assumption is an if-then belief. If things are perfect, then nothing bad will happen. And there's another assumption connected to that is if things aren't perfect, then all chaos will break loose in my life. So we have that assumption. Now, it's often helpful to come up with a non-anxious assumption, because if I believe things have to be perfect or chaos is going to break out, I'm going to be feeling a lot of pressure all the time. But there could be a non-anxious assumption that if things aren't perfect, then eh, they may not go so well, but it'll all work out in time. That, then you wouldn't feel so anxious. So we've got these two assumptions. What we then want to do is what we call behavioral experiments. We want to do some experiments. And the experiments we do are often to do the things that our anxiety tells us not to do. So Mm -hmm. in this case, it might be to do something imperfectly. You know, make a dinner and overcook or undercook something. Uh, You know, small experiments where we're not doing things perfectly. So allowing yourself to fail, actually. Allowing yourself to fail. In fact, intentionally failing. But we want to use those experiences to not just see, oh, well, the bad thing didn't happen, but to compare what, what I, the two assumptions, which I sometimes call theory one and theory two. It's like we got our anxious theory and our non-anxious theory. So the anxious theory says if I do these things imperfectly, then all chaos and bad things are going to follow. And the non-anxious theory says if I do things imperfectly, some bad things may follow, but I'll be able to handle it. 
And then you do a whole series of experiments over a number of weeks where you do things imperfectly, starting with little things like not cooking something right and moving to bigger things like maybe uh, paying a bill late or something like that. And then you see what happens and some bad consequences may happen, but see if you're able to cope and handle those. And if you learn that the non-anxious theory is right, that sometimes bad things happen, sometimes they don't, but when they do happen, I can handle it. Then all of a sudden you've learned, I don't have to be carrying this anxious theory around all the time because it puts pressure on me and makes my anxiety worse. And maybe if I held on to this other assumption, uh, I could be more relaxed in my life and enjoy my life more. So the idea of figuring out our if-then predictions that anxiety makes and coming up with some non-anxious predictions and then doing experiments where we do the opposite of what anxiety tells us to do and find out which theory has more support based on my own life experience. So one of the uh, theories that I hear, one of the beliefs under it is if something bad happens, I can't tolerate it, nor that I can survive it. And yes. that's where the intensity of the anxiety goes higher. And the higher that intensity, then it turns into like panic attack, anxiety attack and panic attacks because of the relevancy of seeing, oh, I can't tolerate it or I'm not going to survive it. And what I hear but based on that behavioral experiment is that you actually experience, guess what? I tolerated it. And guess what? I survived it. Like, it, you know, yes, some, you know, maybe I have to pay a higher fee or maybe I have to pay some consequences if something happens. Um, but it's okay. Like, I survived. I lived. And uh, I can move on. And then I can learn from it and move on. And that's where I'm hearing that by experimenting it yourself, in that space, you learn to tolerate, you learn your own resilience, you learn that you survived it and everything's going to be okay, right? Exactly. That's a very good summary of what I'm saying. Okay. And um, so when you're going to look at uh, going through the experimentation, how do you then come up with uh, problem solving? And how do you go from the actual uh, essence of the anxiety and then moving from there to problem solving so that now that you've learned how to tolerate it, now you've learned to, to survive it, but now can you also create some problem solving scenarios or not knowing what your strengths are so that maybe hopefully this way of thinking in an anxious mode maybe goes away? Yes. Um, actually, when I talk about doing these behavior experiments, we, we in the Mind of Our Mood book, have a behavior experiment worksheet. And so people can put down not only what their experiment is and what they're predicting, but what are some of the problems they might encounter and how could they handle that those problems so they could keep going. And by writing down some notes about what we do, we start to develop kind of a handbook for non-anxious living for ourselves. We, we start to develop, you know, knowing strategies of how to approach things. What's interesting is we all, just like we're all anxious, we also all have areas of our life where we're quite resilient and where we're not anxious. It might be playing a sport or a particular hobby that we like to do, or maybe we're really good at home decorating or whatever. And in those areas, we also run into problems and difficulties, but because it's an area we feel confident in or that we enjoy, we kind of sail through and we figure out so creative solutions to those problems. So we're, we're actually trying to get people by spending more time with your anxiety, you get a chance to eventually develop as much skill in that area of your life is you have in these other areas where because you enjoy it or you're happy doing it or you feel confident about your skills, uh, problems don't set you back. They don't stop you from enjoying. Uh, if you like to walk, you know, a little rain doesn't discourage you from walking or finding a place to walk where it isn't raining. And so uh, it's the same thing with anxiety. When we're anxious in the beginning of trying to do these experiments and face our fears, 
uh, there's a tendency when we run into obstacles to say, oh, that's it, stop. But what we want people to do is to, if they do stop that day, say, go back and do that imagination exercise and say, what could I have done instead of stopping? What could I do next time? And so in a way, it's very lucky when we run into obstacles facing our fears because that helps us develop our resilience and helps us develop our kind of own knowledge base of how to cope with certain problems that can come up in life. I know but when I uh, look back at my own anxieties, um, you know, I moved here when I was 12, so alone. So it was this concept of aloneness, nobody's out there, or uh, how, who can I trust? And um, if I don't have any backup, I always, you know, was always in the survival mode. So obviously, the anxieties such as trusting at people and how to, and anxieties over um, financial security, and then anxieties over um, our you know, as an immigrant uh, in the United States, how valid or credible I would be. And then, you know, coming to the media, um, you know, I came from Iran when I was 12, so my ang language skills at, uh, in, in Farsi wasn't that great. And then I was an immigrant, so my English wasn't. And then I was in media. So always this anxiety that I'm just not going to be good enough or perfect and my grammar is going to be bad, my vocabulary is going to be bad, my accent wasn't going to be okay. So it seemed like, all of these anxieties, and they were with me. And, yes. coming. and you know, I used a lot of the techniques that you suggested from cognitive therapy, and it really worked for me. Um, and I wanted to share and ask your opinion that would ultimately there had to be a paradigm shift that will show up. Um, it's like you said, this belief systems of if and then and all of that. Uh, and all of the experimentation, finding resilience, where is it that I have strength? At the end for the anxiety kind of like never to show up again, because I think like things show up and then you work it and they show up and then you work through. And then there was always this question, what if, what happens if it just doesn't show up anymore, you know? Yes. Uh, and I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting I'm never anxious for the rest of my life, but those topics, those yes. topics, you know? Well, I, I think, I think one of the things, one of the muscles that gets built when we face our fears is that we do if we keep facing them and we keep getting back up and going after them again and again and again as you have done throughout your life what happens and you can tell me if this is right for you or not is that your coping and resource confidence goes up and up and up and so you say yes i may face more difficulties but i've already coped with so many that i'm sure i can figure out how to do this again i like to say that the best kind of non-anxious philosophy uh, I can think of is in the common phrase, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. And if you can really believe that about yourself, that shows that you are not very anxiety prone because first of all, to say I'll cross that bridge when I come to it, first of all, you have to be willing to say, I'm not gonna think about that bridge unless it's here and I'm facing it. And the second thing is you have to have confidence that I, I can figure out a way. I have an ability to cope. I can use resources in my life to help me. And I have the, the kind of nerve and the courage to do what it takes. And so once people reach that point, then they're not really going to experience anxiety very often. You know, we all can face dangers that are high enough that... Uh, it will evoke anxiety in us. But the more we develop our own confidence in our coping and our knowledge of resources that can help us, uh, the fewer the dangers are that are going to be big enough to make us anxious. Very much. Um, Dr. Podesky, I know I don't know if you work with children or adolescent also. Um, I have noticed in my clientele and the group that I meet that the range of anxiety has... Um, really come to lower and lower ages. Like yes. I've seen so many of now eight year olds, nine year olds, 10 year olds that are high, high, highly anxious way before that I've ever seen before. Um, I see obviously teenagers that are highly anxious and, you know, study after study shows up about college students uh, that have high levels of anxiety and
and depression, uh, but it keeps going lower. Do you have any um, ideas about whether well, it's your practice or your research yeah. that you're doing uh, in the field and what's going on? And how can we support the parents of the children or the children? And how can, you know, uh, is it different? This, the, the source of anxiety that shows up, is it different to be among children and adolescents versus adults or is just the same spectrum? It, it's actually the same spectrum. And it's not a surprise that anxiety is going up in children and adolescents because with uh, media constant presence now and ch children's access to the internet and to news about all kinds of tragedies happening around the world, children today are exposed to many more stories about danger and also children and adolescents who are on social media. Uh, we know from research that's been done that they tend to be more anxious the more hours they spend on social media, more anxious and more depressed. And we think part of the reason for that is that people use the anonymity of the internet to say very mean and hurtful things about people. And this happens to children and adolescents as well as adults. And so uh, children and adolescents are exposed to a lot more danger and a lot more uh, self -critic uh, other criticism from others, et cetera. So to the extent that they don't have the coping and resources, either because they're quite young and just don't have life experience, or because perhaps their uh, parents through much of their life try to remove them from having to handle difficulties, because the parents love them and want to protect them. The problem with parents doing that all the time is then the children don't develop their own confidence and coping and resources. They just turn to mom and dad. And we think this is part of the reason why college students have so much difficulty because they're not used to coping with dangers and threats and challenges in their own life. They're used to more of their parents stepping in and helping them immediately. So one of the things that we need to do as therapists, but also that we can do to support families is support parents in allowing their children to figure out, helping their children figure out solutions to problems and letting the children take their own steps and actions to solve uh, problems and challenges that they might face. Um, just as a, an example, um, Many children watched stories of the, the fires in California uh, this past year where lots of people lost their homes and it was very frightening. And a lot of children were then afraid, what if a fire breaks out at our home? Now, it would not be good to just say to a child, well, our home is safe, it won't have a fire. It would be a good opportunity to build a child's resilience to anxiety to say, well, our home probably won't light on fire, but let's sit down as a family and make a plan for how we would cope if it did, what we would do, how we would help each other. And you could, by talking this through with a child and practicing a plan for how you would get out and what you would do and saying, you know, and we could go stay with grandma and grandpa if our house did burn down and we would work it out and assuring them that there is a path to coping with danger. Uh, and helping them imagine that path of coping, uh, that could do a lot to help inoculate children against serious anxiety problems as they get older. Absolutely. And I sense many parents, when their children get anxiety, they get frustrated. They, mm -hmm. you know, It taps into their own anxiety. And then, yes. you know, that I'm not a good mother or I'm not bad or I have enough and I can't, you know, these are, I can't handle that. And then their frustration shows up. Um, and, you know, instead of having the ability to kind of like maintain and and uh, take care of themselves before they actually sit down and take care of their children also. So it's uh, the first thing is take care of your own anxiety before you can take yes. care of anybody else. <laughs> That's right. And then um, they can also go to the guided applications of uh, the ideas that you were talking about in Mind Over Mood is the second edition that came uh, out in 2016. It's been translated and underway in 22 languages, currently available in 13 languages, but it's going to be to 22. That's awesome. Yeah, it is um, awesome. We're really pleased. 
Yes, and people are going to mindovermood.com, mindovermood.com. And this is a, a, it's written as a self-help book, and they can actually go through the exercises, have them, do it as uh, individually or with family, sit down and kind of look at it. Because my uh, experience has been, and share please with me what your experience is, when someone has anxiety in the house, it's kind of contagious, you know, it kind of, they, they give it to everybody else also. It is. So sometimes going through these exercises personally and as a family system, like you said about the fire or anything that shows up in the family system, it's really um, a way to handle uh, everybody's. So everybody can calm down instead of instigating it and having it fuel for everybody else. Yes, I think that's that's very important because I... I have worked with children in therapy and sometimes the children do so well and then they go and spend more time with a family member who's highly anxious and it gets all their anxiety going again. So it's really helpful for family members who do have anxiety um, to catch themselves and not just give a lot of danger messages to children, but say, you know, there are some dangers in the world, but the good thing is we can learn to cope. We got one minute. Anything in particular that we've missed that you really want everybody who's listening or watching us to know? No, I, I think the well, the most important thing to know is that anxiety is one of the most highly treatable of all problems. So many people will be able to treat it with self-help. But if you are not having good success with self-help, please consider going to a therapist to get some therapy because many of the anxiety anxiety types of anxiety can be treated in a anywhere from five to 15 20 sessions so it's it's nothing you should have to live with the rest of your life thank you so much for spending the time with us and sharing yourself and your knowledge and your book with all of us uh, and hopefully we'll have you back again with us probably once or twice a year and uh, with uh, all the new research that you're doing and everything so thank you thank you very much for inviting me today Thank you, everyone. We're talking to Dr. Christine Padesky. Go to Mind Over Mood. And for all of you who've been listening or watching us, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. Bye-bye. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. 1490 AM Smart Talk Radio, KMET. Banning, Bowman.